I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Welcome, everyone, to another Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I'm your host, Adam Campbell. It's great to have you. It is December 4th. I've got a great show for you this week. In The Devil's Advocate, it's going to be part four of nine on how to be God or the devil. An infernal informant, Obama says he will seek more money for AIDS programs and names proposed for two new elements on periodic table. And in Creature Feature, I'm bringing you... G. Edwin Taylor. We're going to be talking about his art, paintings, and what to expect from him in the future. And if I've got time, I'm going to dive into another Bizarre the Bizarre. i got another one for you. I want to talk to you first about my week. What I've been doing. Today, I, uh, I brewed another batch of beer. And actually, I'm a little bit late on this one, but I'm brewed, I brewed a uh, pumpkin porter. So it's going to be a, a really dark, um, rich beer with the flavor of pumpkin on the back end of it. I'm hoping it's going to be good. You never know with beers that are flavored because the flavor could be overwhelming, uh, really drowning out the actual style of beer, in this case a porter, or it can just be too much for you to even handle consuming, uh, in which case you would have wasted an entire batch, uh, both of which I want to avoid if at all possible. Um, Brewing is always something that is incredibly fun for me. The smells, the process, spending time with the the family, the, with the wife, uh, helping me out. And this year we erected the um, solstice tree or the Christmas tree, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, because I am uh, one half of this family marriage, uh, I pretty much am at the whim of <laughs> uh, my wife <laughs> in what she wants to do for holidays. Um, I have no, I actually have no problem with putting up a Christmas tree. Um, I think it's, it's a lot of fun. It sparks that initial magical, um, flame in the children for the holiday. And I think that is incredibly important, no matter what religious background you come from. So that process itself is fine with me. We have these funny ornaments that I had actually mentioned in a previous episode, an interview with uh, Keepers, and it's essentially these two snowmen, uh, anatomically exaggerated. Uh, <laughs> so the, the guy snowman has this gigantic snow cock and balls, and the, the female snowman, I guess you would even call it. Uh, as these gigantic snow breasts. It was, it's really funny. So my son, for the first time, really connected with what he was looking at when he was putting these ornaments on the trees. Like, like he's done it in years past, but never really connected with them. He never really thought about what he was looking at. You know, he just thought, hey, a snowman, awesome. This time he was giggling like a little schoolgirl, and it, that, you know, that made it a little bit funny, and um, just him realizing what he was handling and stuff. It was kind of fun. I also opened up a beer today, and it was it was weird because normally you can tell whether or not uh, a beer is going to explode because every other beer in that batch <laughs> has exploded already. And traditionally, in my um, in my experience, it's always been a heavy grain beer for whatever reason um, is a lot more um, potent, a lot more carbonated, and it tends to uh, foam up for no apparent reason. And I brewed this um, Schwarzbier. Schwarzbier, however you want to say it. It's German for dark beer. And uh, it literally exploded in my face. And what was crazy about it is that I already had a couple from this batch over the past week. And none of them did that. In fact, this had been a very, very stable beer, <laughs> which I've been enjoying quite uh 
heavily, actually. <laughs> well, I had the opportunity. And this one just blew up in my face all over. There was literally like a quarter of an inch left of actual beer in the bottom of the bottle. So I don't know if this was like a prank on my family, just like shaking up the beer, waiting for me to grab it. But pretty big mess. And a note for all you out there, if you're opening up a homebrew, uh, do it near a sink. <laughs> don't And don't look right at it as you're popping it open because you end up with a sticky face. I would imagine it's a lot like, uh, I don't know, maybe a lady in the porn industry or something would feel <laughs> first day on the job. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, all right, so that's going to be it for the intro. Uh, how about we dive into this show? Actually, you know what, before I do, so I was watching the Christmas story, uh, the Muppets Christmas story with my family just a little bit ago, and one thing about that show, I mean, you know, generally holiday shows are, you know, pretty infantile and, and crazy and stuff, um, and they all sort of have their morals usually centered around this idea that uh, Christmas time is a time for giving. And as I'm watching it, the first ghosts pop up, and in this case, it's Waldorf and Statler, uh, you know, Marley and Marley in the show, and they're doing this little song and dance, but the message behind it was that if you don't give away that which you worked for, then you will be doomed to an eternity in chains, presumably hell. And... This is the, the the center, this is the central idea behind this entire show, is that Ebenezer Scrooge is a, a man, and, and let's sort of look at this from a different perspective. He's a man who has been shunned, an outcast, um, his entire life. It's forced him to focus more on his schoolwork and more on his professional career, in this case, banking. And then... When he is a man of means, people come to him and expect him to give up what he has essentially been working his whole life for. And, you know, like I said a second ago, that's the message of this whole show. But, I mean, is that really, is that really the idealistic world that we live, that we want to live in? I mean, they didn't want him around. They didn't care about him when he was young and penniless and a student. They didn't care about him when he was coming up in the banking world. Only when he's in power and he has the means, suddenly everyone wants a piece. I have a hard time looking at that character and being derogatory or negative toward him at all. Now, I understand he can be overly cruel and, okay, well, I get that. Situation dependent. But outside of that, really all he's doing is protecting what he's worked for. Uh, and he's following the letter of the law to a T. And on an individual basis, you know, people can have leverage with whatever laws they want to have, um, they want to follow in their society, whatever. But this character in this story is, in my opinion, getting the short end of the stick. And then, in order to get this man to think the way the author wanted him to think or to act the way uh, the rest of the people in this idealistic world acted. They have to literally torture him. Um, and you can actually see it kind of like, and I'm sort of going to be doing this for the rest of this season, taking a look at uh, popular stories and just elements of Christmas and putting a little spin on them, so expect that. Um, so they literally are torturing this guy as if, uh, you know, indoctrinating him. So they abduct him, they force him to relive moments in his life, and then force a new narrative onto him. And they do not concede, they do not let up until he sees it that way. A little different way to look at this. So Ebenezer Scrooge is literally a successful man who has had the world shit on him, and so finally he's in a position of power... They want to take that from him, too. And to do it, they torture him, they indoctrinate him, and they succeed. Not uh, 
Not a good message in my book. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, I don't mind giving a buck or two to friends who, who want it or... Um, tonight's uh, interview with uh, Gio Dun Taylor, we talk a little bit about um, a charity that he's uh, been introduced to that I think may, have be, may be of interest to others. But generally, you know, charity's not, it's not my bag. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I work for what I have and I want to um, exhaust it in the manner that I'm comfortable and that's with my friends and family. I don't want to give it away to some stranger, especially when that stranger's uh, go-to line for receiving a gift is God bless you. Eh, fuck you. Alright, so that's good. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop it there because that's going to be coloring the rest of this month of episodes. Um, just wait till I get onto that communist Frosty the Snowman next week. Holy crap. Alright, <laughs> my my carbon dioxide uh, alarm has just gone off. <laughs> I hope it doesn't do it again. I might not be uh, making it out for another week. Alright, I'm sorry about saying anything about Frosty the Snowman. He's not a commie. He's a commie. <laughs> Let's jump into the devil's advocate. In this arid wilderness of steel and stone, I'll raise up my voice that you may hear to the east and to the west I beckon, to the north and to the south. I show a sign proclaiming a death to the weakling, wealth to the strong. Can I get a hail Satan? I said, can I get a hail Satan? We are the devil's advocates. Welcome to the devil's advocate. As always, let me preface this segment by saying that I am a Satanist, I am a member of the Church of Satan, but I do not speak for the Church of Satan. That is all. You must have style. Class. That's number four of nine. Let's uh, recap a little bit here on how to be a god or the devil. One, don't advertise. Two, never be fashionable. Three, you must be creative. And four, you must have class. You must have style. And what does that mean? I mean, we already talked about sort of your personal appearance. Well, style and class is speaking a little bit more to how you project yourself. Um, you have to be reserved. You have to exhibit control in your own life and when dealing with others. Because if you can't even do that, how are you supposed to run your own universe, right? I mean, how are you really supposed to be your own god if you can't even show... Uh, the minutest amount of uh, uh, reservation when required. And here's another thing that, you know, just thinking about this while, while I'm doing this podcast here. I am not reserved <laughs> when I'm in this environment, when I'm, when I'm around friends, when I'm doing this podcast, when, when I'm with my family. But when I'm at work, it's a completely different me. When I'm in... Uh, the rest of the world, when I'm with mingling with society, as it were, I'm an entirely different human being, uh, and it's because I am comfortable talking with my audience. You, I am comfortable uh, with my family and friends, and I am always guarded and uh, watching and reserved when I'm with everyone else in the world. And that can be for a number of reasons, um, but really as far as uh, this point goes, I present myself in a professional manner when out there, because that's how I want to be seen. I project what I want to be seen as. So you always, there's a couple of songs and there's these ideas of how other people see you and how that's different than you think other people see you. Um, and you can actually read a little bit about this in uh, The uh, Satanic Witch as well. But the point stands that how many of you have ever looked at any of these infantile metalhead pseudos or devil worshippers or just really young, misinformed, misguided youth who are screaming about how shitty X is and how 
great they would be if it was all anarchy or if they were in charge or if their ideas were held as the way to go. Do you ever take that type seriously? No, no one does. Because they act juvenile, they're acting as children, so they are perceived as children. Um, and I can call back to previous interviews where, you know, it's been stated, be a gentleman. Just, if somebody asks you how your day is, tell them, I'm doing fine, thank you. Because no one really wants to hear. No one wants to know. If you go up to someone and they ask you how your day is and you just start laying it on them about their whole day, well, you know, first of all, they don't really want to know. They're just being polite. And so the response that they should be given is polite, not exhaustive, not lengthy, because no one cares about you. Only you and yours care about you. Uh, So why are you telling your problems to the outside, right? To someone who doesn't care. Show restraint. Be reserved in how you interact with others. Uh, And if you're amongst friends, be you. That's one of the steps. Have class. Have style. Be reserved. Be your own god. Let's move on to the Infernal Informant. What is of darkness? Earthquakes! Volcanoes! The dead rising from the grave! Human sacrifice! Dogs and cats living together! Mass hysteria! All in the Infernal Informant! Obama says he will seek more money for AIDS programs. By Jackie Calms, published December 1st. And this is the New York Times politics. President Obama won plaudits from AIDS groups that had criticized him in the past with his announcement on Thursday that he is seeking additional federal money for efforts to prevent and treat the disease in the United States and globally. So make no mistake, we are going to win this fight, Mr. Obama told an audience of international activists, celebrities, and lawmakers of both parties assembled at George Washington University for the annual World AIDS Day, 30 years after the disease was identified. But the fight is not over, not by a long shot. That comment seemed directed at potential donors, whether organizations, individuals, or other countries. Advocacy groups say contributions have suffered as perceptions have taken hold that the epidemic has been arrested. Mr. Obama acknowledged that while the rate of infection has declined elsewhere, in the United States it has remained steady, disproportionately hitting the young, African Americans and Hispanics. The fight is not over, not for the 1.2 million Americans who are living with HIV right now, not for the Americans who are infected every day, or their families, Mr. Obama said. And he added, it certainly isn't over for your president. For the domestic fight, Mr. Obama announces that he was committed to seeking 15 million more for the Ryan White program supporting HIV medical clinics in the United States and 35 million for state programs providing access to necessary drugs. For global efforts, he set a goal of nearly doubling to 6 million the number of infected people who will get antiretroviral AIDS drugs through a program that his predecessor George W. Bush started. Mr. Bush and former President Bill Clinton appeared by satellite. Mr. Bush from Tanzania, yeah, I think I said that right, (laughs) a focal point of the anti-AIDS effort in Africa. Throughout his administration, activists have complained that the Obama administration has done less for the global fight than Mr. Bush. During the 2010 midterm election campaign season, they repeatedly heckled Mr. Obama at political appearances, a situation the White House surely wants to avoid as he seeks re-election in 2012. On Wednesday, Mr. Obama paid tribute to Mr. Bush, calling his contributions one of the greatest legacies, but he also strongly defended his own record. Mr. Obama said that under his administration, the government has increased support for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and reauthorized the Ryan White program, and to applause from attendees, including the musicians Bono, 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 (laughs) she's Bono, we're going to say Bono, and Alicia Keys. He recalled that he had ended a band that prevented people 
with HIV AIDS from entering the country, an action that cleared the way for the United States to host an international AIDS conference next year for the first time in the gathering's two decades. The president just put a powerful down payment toward the end of the AIDS crisis, said Matthew Kavanaugh, director of advocacy for Healthy GAP, an activist group, in a statement. And the international group Doctors Without Borders hailed Mr. Obama's financial commitment as the shot in the arm that the global HIV AIDS response needs right now. Get it? Shot in the arm? They're sick, they get shots? (laughs) And called on Congress to turn this commitment into reality. For several minutes after his address, Mr. Obama greeted audience members, then he returned to the White House where a huge red ribbon hung from the North Portico in honor of World AIDS Day, flanked by two newly decorated Christmas trees. All right, I got a couple things to say about this. Uh, Okay, first of all, uh, really shitty way to say that, the shot in the arm. We don't want to hear your perceived clever quips in response to political pandering. Uh, More to this, he stated, turn this commitment into reality from Congress? Has he been paying attention to Congress at all over the past fucking four years now? Or, you know, we're coming on four years. They don't do anything. They don't get along at all. Anything that President Obama wants to do, they reject. And it's partially because most of what Mr. Obama wants to do doesn't jive with the majority, but also it has a ton to do with the Republican and Tea Party's insistence that everything Obama wants to do is bad, therefore they reject it, even if it's in their own self-interest. How's that for pandering? Uh, Okay, so let's talk about AIDS, shall we? There's two ways that I see this, right or wrong. My immediate perceptions. You get AIDS because of inappropriate behavior, or you get AIDS because of unfortunate circumstances, i.e. you were born with it because your mother had it, or it was given to you because of some medical mishap of never checking clean drugs, or you were raped and you got it that way. Uh, Either way, it was either your fault or it was an unfortunate incident where you got it. And I think the the chances of identifying that are pretty easy and separating it out. And why do I think we should separate it out? Because I think people who are taking gambles with their lives deliberately don't deserve public funding to prevent or to stave off this disease that their lack of obvious concern with themselves and their own health at the time granted them. They deserve what they get. If you're going to have sex unprotected with someone that you don't know and you haven't had screened and you just don't trust, you deserve this horrible disease. You absolutely deserve it. On the other hand, if you did contract it by no fault of your own, and again, I think it's pretty easy to figure out whether or not it was your fault, then I think things like this are great. I, I, I do think the society in you live should help its responsible citizens continue being responsible citizens, meaning they contribute to the, the, the greater health of the nation as well. Um, now, I actually know a couple of people who are going to say that's kind of socialist of me to say. <laughs> and fine, you know, that's your opinion. That's awesome. But I think the entire role of a government is to support its people. I mean, that's what it was created to do, protect and serve the people. Uh, I think we should be focusing on a national scale and not so much on a state or individual level. But, you know, when you break it down, that's what it's there for. So for responsible citizens who get this horrid, horrid disease, um, okay, you know, money like this I think is well spent. I'd say, you know, pull back from maybe our uh, industrial military complex to help pay for it. But Congress is never going to turn to something. What about the <laughs> the responders to 9-11? They didn't even pass that bill to help pay for their health. But they're going to do it for this? I mean, those guys went out of their way and it jumped into burning, collapsing buildings to rescue fellow citizens. Uh, these are people who have either just had shitty 
fucking luck or have been irresponsible with their lives. Um, I say go with the responders first. They didn't do that. So will they follow through with this commitment that Mr. Obama said? And, and does he even care in the first place? If he hadn't done anything up until now, it's obvious this is just the political process taking its course. He is gearing up for the election and he wants to be able to say, I tried to spend millions of dollars on AIDS and to help these poor people in other countries who have contracted it because of uh, shitty education and cultural uh, retardation. He's not going to put it like that, but <laughs> I will. Um, knowing that it'll never pass, so he can say, well, the Republicans didn't want to do it, that's why you should vote for me again. It's brilliant, it's disgusting, uh, and it works, unfortunately, and that's why we keep doing it. I wonder when, if ever, we're, as a country, going to wake up and realize that the process that we're working under isn't the most efficient. Anyway... Uh, AIDS is terrible, and I sympathize with those who have contracted it by no fault of their own. And for those of you who have, this is what you get, man. Or woman. Or kid. Yeah. In my opinion, if you're a kid going through your tough teens and you decide to uh, inject drugs or have sex and you contract this, or you know, that's your fault. And that's something that you're going to have to deal with. Reality's a bitch. Take responsibility for your actions. Don't look to us to help alleviate your pain when you didn't pay attention to what you were doing. Uh, that's my opinion anyway. The next article, Names Proposed for New Elements on Periodic Table. Again, this is also New York Times. Add two names to the periodic table of elements, although you may want to write them in pencil for now. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, the scientific body that is the keeper of the list of elements, unveiled Thursday the proposed names for elements 114 and 116. Fluorovium, atomic symbol FL, and Livermorium, atomic symbol LV. If you do not like them, now is the time to voice your objections. The Chemistry Union will have a five-month commitment period open to anyone. We believe... We have to let the world respond, said Terry A. Renner, the Chemistry Union's executive director. It's a desire to be fair and recognize everyone's right to contribute as a scientist. The Chemistry Union, along with its physics counterpart, spent years checking data before finally accepting in June that the two elements had indeed been created in collaborative experiments by the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubna, Russia, and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in Livermore, California. The process of coming up with what to call them was nearly as arduous. Through all of human history, only 114 elements have been named, and the chemistry union has finicky rules about what is an acceptable name. For example, if the chemistry union rejects a name, that name cannot be proposed for any subsequent element discoveries, Dr. Renner said. We were thinking from all kinds of angles, said Mark A. Stoyer, a Livermore physicist who was a member of the discovery team. Dr. Stoyer said Livermore scientists had very open and honest debates in narrowing 50 possible names to the three they offered to their Russian colleagues, who also offered three names. In the end, they settled on the obvious ones. Livermorium is, of course, named after the laboratory the city was located. Dubna was, has already been enshrined in the periodic table with Dubnium, element 105, so the Russians chose to honor Grigory N. Flerov, the founder of the Research Institute. The discoveries gave their suggestions to a committee at the Chemistry Union, which agreed. The public comments can range from serious to not as serious. Dr. Renner recalled during the naming of Element 112, now known as Copernicum, that an official from a school in New York called and said the students there thought it should be instead named after their school, PS 112. Barring a major kerfuffle... Dr. Kenner said the proposed names will get the stamp of approval next May. A major kerfuffle. I don't think I've ever experienced a major kerfuffle. When I think of kerfuffle, I don't think there's a major version of it. I, you know, it's sort of like old hags bitching in line or uh, you're... You're going to have a kerfuffle over your coffee not being presented in the right way. or A kerfuffle's never major. I mean, you don't want to talk about major. Well, that's going to be a situation. That's going to be a, uh, 
an explosive moment, but not a, a major kerfuffle. That's absurd. Or maybe this entire process is absurd. Why don't <laughs> why why is the public have any type? Did the public help identify these new elements? I mean, who are they trying to please? I understand you take it to your union, and the union agrees, and that should be the end of it. I, if I discovered something, um, whether it's with podcasting, or whether it's, it's with homebrewing, or whether it's with graphic design, or just in general with art, I wouldn't go to anyone else in that industry and be like, hey, uh, do you mind if I call it um, Adam Campbell Kickassicus? Because it's none of your damn business. I mean, you're going to have to learn it, you're going to have to live with it, but it should be up to the people who discovered it to have absolute authority. Now, they're saying that there is still time, so if you don't like it, reach out to them. And I think that's very gracious of them. You cannot ever say that, and in this case, the chemistry scientists are um, above everyone else. Uh, that They won't give you a chance to voice your, your opinion on, on you know little decisions like this. Um, but uh, it's it's a little goofy nonetheless, I think. Uh, let's talk here about how it expanded. Um, they only exist for seconds at the most in real life. They actually are created by smashing atoms together. And that's what creates new ones. So the experiments last for weeks, and uh, they make an atom every week or so, and that is the added elements that uh, they're, you know, creating, man-made. They were discovered by a collaboration of scientists by smashing calcium ions into atoms of plutonium, or another element, curium. Curious. So, they only exist for seconds, if that, I mean, we're talking scientific seconds, so it's like, you know, hundreds of milliseconds before they disappear. Um... Should we really be adding them to the periodic table of elements? I I would like to think that the periodic table is um, a list of, of all and everything. But do we really need that? I mean, can we have like a backup? Can we can we have a crib note table where, where we have elements that are always around and do not depend on us manufacturing them, i.e., you know, natural phenomena, and then we'll have another table, the expanded, the the, the uh, unabridged version, which <laughs> which will be everything that we can fucking create, everything we can make up. Because I feel like they're completely separate. Like if nature was just running its course, there would be the little uh, little flipbook version, and then once we get involved, we get the monstrous encyclopedia version, right? And, I mean, this is all self-serving, so I guess in some level it doesn't really matter, but I just feel like, I don't know, we're making shit up, and who knows, it may lead to some amazing discovery of time travel, or it may lead to some amazing discovery furthering the idea of, of multiple dimensions, um, uh, or, or proving string theory or something. Uh, but it's just, like, so self-serving, in my opinion. And the fact that they only exist for seconds... I mean, they better have a really good uh, uh, replicating process, <laughs> you know, because you can be like, uh, I mean, I, I'm not trying to shortcut the scientific process, and I'm not trying to shortcut the scientists for their hard, laborious work, um, because I, I do think it's absolutely worthy, and I think it's fascinating when we find something new like this. Uh, I just don't know if it applies to everyone. You know, I mean, it's like, are they going to be teaching these two new elements in schools when, you know, generic information is passed out of schools? I mean, is that, I mean, it'd be neat as a discovery standpoint, but I would rather my kids learning about elements that are always there. And then when they go to college or for their education, be focusing on stuff like this. I don't know that they would um, necessarily. And I don't even think it's a bad thing if they do. I'm just, you know, sort of tossing these ideas around in my head. I'm not sure I'm okay with adding elements that only exist for seconds, and I don't know why. Anyway, you can email me if uh, you think I'm crazy or absurd, or if my opinions should only last for seconds. <laughs> Info at 9 Uh That's going to do it for the Infernal Informant. Let's jump over right after commercial break to a very great interview 
in Creature Feature with G. Edwin Taylor. You know, dogs are different than cats. And hey, what if Jack Nichols said we're a- Hey, what if we are the world was sung by the cast of Friends? I think it might go something like this. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Leno. Anyone remember when I was funny? Eat Doritos. Ladies and gentlemen, Dane Cook. Are you fed up with comedy that's made for the masses? Sick of stand-up comedian hacks with the same old routines that you've heard a thousand times before? Equally tired of shock jocks who equate loudness with laughter? Hello, my name is Reverend Bill M., creator and host of The Devil's Mischief, a show where every week I present a new hour of comedy and novelty of devilish proportions. So tune in to The Devil's Mischief. Visit devilsmischief.com or radiofreesatan.com to download the latest podcast. The Devil's Mischief. Carnal comedy clips and netherworld novelty numbers simply not made for the masses. Hello, my name's Dave Ingram. And I'm Donovan. And we are Metal Breakfast Radio. Yep. Inviting you to join us with a few beers each week. For a dose of metal scrutiny. Some verbal skullduggery. And a hell of a lot of rubbish. Rubbish! Find us on metalbreakfastradio.com, darksentinel.dk, and radiofreesatan.com. Through the trees, the damsel in distress comes, breaking through the underbrush. Fear painted on her face. The darkness hunting her is near. She the swamp, water slowing her escape. The creature nears, the damsel turns, hands rising to her sides as a last effort to thrust the creature back. Welcome to Creature Feature. Welcome to another Creature Feature. Today I have a very special guest. I have G. Edwin Taylor. We're going to be talking about his passion, his art. We're going to talk about some projects that he's been involved in, some gallery shows, and then, you know, what to expect from him in the future. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, How are you today? I am doing absolutely wonderful. How are you? Thanks. I'm good. I'm I'm doing very well. As always, let me just sort of... uh, Let's talk about uh, the man behind the artwork here. We, whenever I have a, a guest on, um, we always sort of uh, present them initially, and then we present their work. When did you first identify yourself as an artist? Oh, uh, that was way before I was even in kindergarten. Pretty much as soon as I could pick up a crayon, I was drawing. Nice. Um, yeah, back when, um, actually when I was in kindergarten, you know, kids would always have to draw you know family portraits and all that i was always drawn to you know horror darker side of everything and well you know my portraits you know the family would always have like vampire fangs and you know (laughs) the sun you know the bright happy sun in the sky would always have monster teeth and even including the dog (laughs) you know i mean just since you mentioned that i think it would be like a really fascinating series of pictures is to sort of take these innocent children drawings that (laughs) they're sort of just like that naturally like your collection Mm -hmm. of your drawings when you're a kid and put that as a book i think that would be a an amazing insight to uh not only the creativity but the individualism of of what we can actually be as kids when we're not sort of uh brainwashed you know (laughs) oh yeah um actually yeah unfortunately i don't have any of those drawings uh, around, but um, I've been told by uh, numerous family members that they kept a lot of those. <laughs> so I'm waiting because I've told them that I'd like to see them because I'd like to actually scan them and post them up so people can see. You know, hey, this is me as a little as a, as a, a wee one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can see great. what path I was already on. Yeah. Uh, when did you first realize that you were a Satanist? Uh, that happened when I was in high school. I was um, about 17 years old. That's when I first read the Satanic Bible. And that actually led, that was a huge ordeal because I went to a public high school, but it was a, 
it was like like a college prep high school where you know it was advanced students only you know and you had to have at least a b average to get in mm-hmm. and <clears throat> the, during this time the satanic panic had, was in full swing and uh at one point i basically my artwork got banned from the high school oh, uh, the, my art my my one art teacher during that time said, you know, claimed that I was bringing demons and devils into the classroom <laughs> because of, you know, I painted horror. But, you know, per, you know, within, you know, a couple of months before that, you know, he had it on display and showing everybody like this is talent. This is, you know, this is, you know, what you can do if you actually put your mind to it. You know, and then, you know, like I said, you know, a couple of weeks later, he's throwing it at me, telling me to get it out. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> oh yeah, it was it was bad. They were trying to find ways to uh, expel me. Whoa! Uh, because of this, and all I kept was like, I don't know what the hell any of you are talking about. <laughs> I'm just drawing, I'm like, man. <laughs> I'm like I'm just drawing, you know, like monsters and horror related, whatever. And but you know, I was always interested in magic and the darker side of everything. My and, you know, a friend of mine at the time, you know, suggested I read the Satanic Bible. So, you know, I went out and bought it that day. And, you know, I read it like that night. And I was just, you know, taken aback. I was like, oh, egads, this is me. <laughs> and I, so I had to like, you know, that first week I read it like three times. And, you know, after that I was like, wow, everyone knew that. Bef-, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, everyone knew it before I did. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think it's always a trip whenever you you sort of you, you feel like you have you know this little secret locked up inside of you and then you read something like the, the satanic bible and you're just like ah shit <laughs> there's other people too which you know in, in one part it's it's kind of liberating that you're not the only one that thinks and you know believes these sort of things um so it, and it's always nice to meet like-minded individuals as well um, of course but so when did you first join the church of satan Ooh, as far as the exact year, I can't quite remember. Um, it was in uh, mid ninety, early to mid nineties. Oh, wow. I'm thinking maybe about ninety five, maybe ninety six. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, I was a Satanist, you know, by definition. You know, once I realized for several years before I finally decided, you know what, I'm going to throw my hat in and join the church. Yeah. What was it that prompted that? Uh, the joining of the church? Yeah. It, basically, I just wanted to show my respect for LeVay and the uh, philosophy and the organization. And, you know, I just felt, uh, like, drawn to it. And so I was like, yep, okay. Time to toss my hat into the mix. Yeah. And it's always interesting because, you know, whenever you look at other types of organizations that people join into... You know, for most of us, Satanists, it's just, you know, we always shun away from stuff like that. And then when you see something like the Church of Satan, and you're just like, wow, you know what? I, I would never, like, normally join a group of people doing things together, but this, for some reason, you know, it, it's just really a part of who I am. I feel compelled to just, you know, step in that ring and just, you know, proudly stand with uh, the other you know, self-identified individuals. It's... It's one of those things that uh, I know, for me at least, I mean, I'm sure for you too, it was just this defining moment in your life of, of proclaiming who you are, not just to yourself, but to others, and, and that's that's empowering. Oh, very much so. Uh, actually, there was a little, um, there's like a little quick, uh, funny little anecdote with that. Because when I, I had, you know, debated whether or not because of the whole non-joining thing, I was like, eh, I don't know, but, you know, eventually I was like, nah, it's, I, I need to. And I decided to use the Christmas money that I had been given by family members. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to treat myself to my own little Christmas present. <laughs> nice. And that's, yeah. And I was like, okay. And of course, I told everybody where I was going to be used. You know, my family knows what, you know, that I'm a Satanist. And they're just like, all right. <laughs> makes you happy. <laughs> I, but I mean that that is a pretty good uh, take on it. I mean they could have been, uh, you know, pretty negative too. They could have been. Um, I think a lot of that actually had to do with my grandmother. Uh, she was born and raised Lutheran, and but she was always you know drawn to magic. She was you know when I was a little kid, she gave me my first Ouija board. 
oh, cool. to play around with. She gave me my first set of tarot cards when I was like 10. And then when I was um, about 12, she gave me my first couple of books on um, magic. Yeah, oh, that's so awesome. My parents, yeah, so like my family were like, all right, you know, he's, yeah, kind of like following her footsteps in a way. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like, you know, yeah, without her, it would have been a hell of a lot harder. Nice. That's really cool because, you know, without even, well, maybe with knowing it, but, you know, she was just an early age encouraging, you know, may, maybe it's something that she saw in you, you know, that, that, that you were different. And so she was trying to help you develop that. That's nice. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, I actually, not too long ago, my, uh, some of my family members were telling me a story when I was, you know, about when I was three years old, my grandmother and my grandfather had taken me to Wisconsin Dells and I threw a fit because I wanted to go into the wax museum and they, you know, my grandma was like, I don't know, you know, he's only three, it's going to scare him. But yeah, I was crying because I couldn't get in there. <laughs> so my grandmother decided, all right, fine, just to shut me up and, you know, took me in. And, you know, afterwards I heard, you know, my grandma was like, yeah, he's not like other kids. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to go in there and he had way too much fun. <laughs> other kids were crying to get out and he was just crying to get in. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, so what inspired you throughout the years to create art? I, what are some of your influences? Oh, as far as artistic influences, it's, you know, it, it runs across the board. I mean, it goes from everything from literary, you know, uh, literary fiction to, you know, actual artists themselves. Uh, as far as uh, actual artists, um, a lot of the pulp fiction artists of, uh, you know, the 20s and 30s, and, you know, even into the men's adventure magazines, you know, of the 50s through 70s. Yeah. Uh, you know, artists like Norman Rockwell, Margaret Brundage, um, Virgil Finlay. You know, uh, Rafael de Soto, they were all, you know, main, you know, main influences. And then later on, you know, of course, then you have, you know, you have to add in Frank Frazetta. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have to add, uh, add in H.R. Geiger. Uh, Ivan Albright was another one, although his influence is a little different as far, you know, with me. You know, I don't paint in his style, but I took um, the way he would um, title his paintings. You know, where they would create, you know, they would help create the story that he was um, showing. Huh. You know, so that's why I use, you know, that's where, like, you know, that's why I have all these lengthy titles a lot of the times, mainly because of him. Yeah. And as far as, like, with the literary, you know, main, the, again, Pulp Fiction, Robert Howard, and Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. Lovecraft, you know, they're all, they're all kind of got tossed into the mix. Nice. So if you had to describe your, your artwork, how, uh, what, what would you say um, to someone you know, that, that just first meets you and says, oh, you're an artist. Well, what do you do? What do you paint? Uh, I tell them I paint the thrilling. You know, I, I uh, create a world where they, you know, when they look at it, they're taken you know, into their imagination. Nice. You know, that's, you know, that's the quick little pitch or the elevator pitch, if you want to call it that. Yeah. You know, it all boils down to painting the thrilling, something that captures your eye and doesn't let go. It makes you wonder. Nice. What was it for you as an artist? Did you ever have any hurdle that you had to get over? I mean, whether it's a technical hurdle or just uh, something inside of you to, you know, just sort of uh, push through in order to really get to a point where you're, you know, content with your style or content with the message that you're sending in your artwork. Did you ever have any anything that you just had a trouble getting over? Uh, painting. Yeah. You know, back in high school, I was, you know, again, it was because it was a college prep uh, school. Uh, we were allowed to choose majors, and I was an art major. So my curriculum was based around that. Huh? And I sucked at painting. <laughs> I was good at drawing, but I was horrible at painting. And actually, I, after high school, I stopped painting. I just went, continued to keep drawing, you know, until several years ago, where I had the urge to pick up the brush again. When I went back to it, I was like, holy shit. I haven't painted in 17 years. <laughs> you know, the stuff that I was producing then was just, yeah, it was horrid. 
I mean, some of the stuff was good, but I look at it and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, somehow along lines, you know, all, over all those years, I picked up all these techniques and I was able to use them and you know, I was able to do what I, what I always wanted to do. But you know, now I just wonder, you know, what had happened if I had uh, actually continued to paint during that time. You know, how much further along I'd be now. Yeah. So do you see it like that where it, it's like a a continuing scale of advancement or do you feel like you know you can reach a point where you're just content with what you do? Actually, well, now it's always it's a it's continuing advancement. Yeah. I know 5 years from now I'm going to be better than I am now because I'm always learning. Mm-hmm. You know, uh as far as uh like with drawing, actually I need to get back into drawing. I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, as far as like with with the painting process and all that, I'm always learning new stuff. And like every year, I see the progression and progression, progression, progression. And I know it's always going to be that way. You know, by the time I'm 70 and still painting, my work's going to be you know that much more phenomenal than what it is now. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, now that we're talking about it, where can people go online in order to see your work? They can go to my website, which is www.taylor9.com. Okay. Uh, the, the site itself is a little outdated. It's actually being rebuilt from the ground up. Wow. But um, I, I really don't know when the new site will be ready. But until then, the old site's still up so people can see, you know, see my work. Nice. And, of course, from there, that has links to you know my blog and, you know, you know, my Facebook fan page and my Twitter, if people want to, you know, contact me through there and what have you. Well, they, and they can also see you on a, the cover of uh, The King in Yellow, right? Yes, yes, Underworld Amusements and Reverend Slaughter. <laughs> that was uh, that was a fun thing and quite surprising. Because uh, this actually started with um, my cur- the current exhibit at Gallery Provocateur, which is Things That Go Bump in the Night. Which is their annual Halloween exhibit. It's you know it's a three month show, nice. and you know I had com- actually I'd completely forgotten you know about it at one point, and then I was like, all right, it's too late to submit anything. And then I was online, and I noticed that they mentioned that they had a couple of spots that needed to be filled. So I you know I sent off my submission right away, and within a couple of days, they're like, yeah, okay, we want these four pieces. And then the owner, uh, Veronica, told me that she wanted me specifically to paint an additional two to four more just for the show. Nice. And I, you know, was you know racking my brain like, well, what the hell am I going to do? I don't <laughs> want to do this. I've already done that already. I don't want to. You know, I'm like, where do I want to take this? I want to do something special. And then it dawned on me. I'm like, you know, the King in Yellow. You don't really see many artists. You know, giving a nod to Robert Chambers and, you know, and his creation. It's always, you know, Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Chambers influenced, you know, inspired Lovecraft. So, you know, that's when I was, that's when I decided, I'm like, no, what? I'm just going to do a, you know, small series specifically based on The King in Yellow. And, you know, I had fans who were asking me, oh, you know, telling me that they really wanted to see what I was working on. So I decided just for a special little treat that I give everybody a sneak peek of what was going to be in the show. And I had posted a couple of the paintings online. It was, you know, for a weekend only. I was like, you know, whoever sees it gets to see it. After that, it's taken down until it's actually unveiled. Nice. And Reverend Slaughter was, uh, you know, he was one of the few, or he, I shouldn't say few, but he was one of the people who had seen it and told me, he's like, you know, hey, you know, uh, I've been working on... Uh, you know, a really a special release for the King in Yellow, and you know, I'd really, I think, you know, the uh, two of your paintings would be great as you know, both as the front and back cover. And so that's how that all kind of started, and yeah, that's now available on Amazon. But it's a uh, strictly, it's very limited edition. It um, went, uh, it was offered to the public on the 29th of October, mm. which uh, coincided with the opening reception for the gallery. And it will end on the at the the very last day of uh, January. That's after that there will be no more made. Wow. So whoever gets them gets them. Nice. Uh, and actually, to even go a little bit further into that, uh, earlier this week I came across uh, a toy drive 
or a special toy drive for Toys for Tots, which is um, Toys for Tots horror style, where they were asking people, you know, art, uh, authors to submit a book that, you know, one of their books, and, you know, they'd sign it, where people would, you know, donate a toy to Toys for Tots, take a shot, you know, take a pic of them actually donating the toy and then post it on their, pro on their uh, Facebook profile. And, you know, at, on January 1st, they're going to choose one lucky person. They're going to win the whole kit and caboodle. So I was like, oh, hell yeah. You know, so um, I'm actually, I decided, again, toss my hat in with this because I really liked the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a signed copy of that limited edition as part of the uh, gift package for that one lucky person. Oh, very cool. Oh, anything that can help, you know, that's, I, I think kids for, you know, should have at least, you know, one toy for Christmas. You know, that's how it was for me when I was growing up, and I'm like, you know, a kid needs, you know, deserves to be happy. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, no matter what I can do, no matter how small, if I can somehow influence people to kind of donate, then fine, because then that means that's that many more kids that'll actually be happy for a little while. Hell yeah. And to me, that's what that's what's worth it. Yeah, I'll make sure to put a link to that in the show notes as well. So that other people can look at donating um, to that cause as well. I mean, and that is one of those things where, um, you know, being a parent, there's a sort of commercialization of the season where you feel obligated to do certain things, um, uh, like you know, buy a bunch of presents and give them to your kids. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I think that's sort of, I mean, being a parent, I see it from that angle, and I sort of kick myself for it, because I forget that, you know, there is a genuine magical side of it to the children. And to to try to uh, dull that, because I may see things a certain way, um, is in a way robbing them um, of, of of that potential magic that they, they could feel, you know? Exactly. And, I mean, I grew up in a really, really poor environment early on, and so I completely understand not having, you know, being that kid that was left out, for example. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, if, if there's anything we can do to prevent that shit that I felt and that a lot of other kids in my neighborhood felt um, in, a, you know, that situation, well, then, hell, yeah, man, you know, get, get out there and donate to the kids. And I think this is this would be a, this is going to be a fantastic way to not only spread the word, um, that you know, you know, kids do need, uh, especially in the economy that we're living in, uh, extra oh, yeah. helping hand. But also, to uh, like your grandmother did for you, you know, encourage that little step into the other way of thinking. You know, that mm -hmm. third perspective in a way. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm not one. You know, I don't usually donate to charities, but when I saw that, and I was like, yeah, you know, this is something that I felt that I needed to do. Yeah. Well, I think that's great of you. I think that's really cool. Um, so Amazon.com, everyone, The King in Yellow, pick up yeah, the book. Yeah, it's actually listed as um, the G. Edwin Taylor edition, or limited edition. Oh, very cool. Hell yeah. yeah just to narrow down, narrow down that search. Yeah. So things that go bump in the night, that you did a number of paintings specifically for that. Now, was that an auction gallery? Uh, it's, uh, it, well, it's an official gallery, you know, everything's for sale. That's, you know, any work that's actually being shown has to be for sale. So, <clears throat> yeah, that was, I was actually quite surprised. Cause technically that's my first gallery show. And what was even more surprising was like earlier this year, they were just announced by the Chicago reader as being the best established gallery in Chicago. Oh, hell yeah. So, you know, like I think it was like, all right, you know, not only am I in, but I'm, I'm fucking in. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that you did specific work commissioned just for that i think that that's very cool oh yeah that you know i wasn't expecting that part but when she asked i was like oh yeah definitely and yeah i, I wanted to do four but with time constraints i only ended up doing three pieces yeah so um is there somewhere people can go to look at that artwork how long is that going to be available for viewing and for purchase uh for purchase it will be available through i think the mid of january because it's uh, you know like again it's a 
it's an official gallery. It's not like one of those um, alternative spots where you just show your work. Yeah. So you know, it's a it's a three month show, and um, you know, people could go to their website, uh, which is uh, basically it's uh, www.galleryprovocateur.org. And um, provocateur is spelled P R O V O C A T E U R. And if you go in under, uh, you know, current exhibit, it'll show you know things that go bump in the night. And if they want to see the actual pieces themselves, they can go to the store link, and then look it up by each artist, and see which uh, works are available. So quite often, when you, when you when you're involved in, in, in things that are new. Uh, you know, specifically to you, when you when you experience something new, uh, you learn something from it. There is maybe a problem that happened that you had to overcome, or did you? Was there anything like that with this show? Yeah, I had to learn framing. <laughs> yeah, I had never bothered to do. You know, since I'd never had a show, I never really bothered to frame my work. Yeah, I've been published in you know magazines and online publications, and you know for you know several years now, but. You know, with this, it was something a little different. I was like, okay, I need to actually frame this stuff and make it look presentable. And, you know, learn how to hang, you know, and learn how to wire everything. So, yeah, it, I, I ended up doing a lot of research into that. And, yeah, and actually, I was quite surprised that I was able to do it so nice. You know, like my uh, favorite part was learning on uh, how to create a dust seal for the backs. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Is I mean, do they get come at you and and tell you that are, are there a lot of stipulations for types of frames or or framing techniques? I mean, or do you pretty much just have carte blanche because it's your work? Oh, it's basically whatever I want. Um, one of the artists that are in they're exhibiting uh by the goes by the name of you know Larkin. They uh, that artist crocheted the frames for uh, the painting for Whoa. for their paintings. They're very unique looking. <laughs> you know, you just when you walk and see it, you're like, "Wow, holy shit, that looks awesome!" <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a crocheted frame before. Yeah, neither had I. That's why I was like, "Oh my god, look at that!" Huh, I'm gonna have to go and look that up. Um, okay, so let's talk about your process as an artist for a second. I, I mean, we, we've dabbled um, in it a little bit in the conversation already, but when taking on a new painting, like the the up to four that was requested of you for this uh, latest gallery, Things That Go Bump in the Night, um, what's your conceptual process like? I mean, when you go from, from, from concept to execution, do you already, do you go into a new painting with, a specific goal in mind like I want this to be like this I want this to look like this or do you sort of just let the process take you there most of the time I have the goal in already in mind um, mm. you know I'll do a quick little uh, rough sketch just to kind of get the idea figure out the composition then I'll do a much tighter drawing which I'll then transfer to the canvas or the canvas board or linen board cause, well, I prefer working on linen board and then I'll you know, once that's done, I'll, you know, lay in a grayscale underpainting, you know, which will establish my lights and darks. Mm. And then once that's completely dry and I'm happy with how that is, then I'll start dropping into color. And I always choose my color palette, you know, before I actually start painting. I don't just go and like, oh, all right, we'll just wing it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I already know which colors are going to be, which, which colors I'm going to be using for that particular piece. And, you know, I mix my colors. So, you know, I, you know, people always think like, oh, my God, you must have, you know, a ton of paints. I'm like, no, actually, I, I only use six tubes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, I, I had to learn how to, you know, mix every shade and value that I needed back, you know, back during the high school, uh, you know, uh, commercial arts uh, program. Yeah. Wow. A sign of a true artist being able to mix your own colors, I think. Oh yeah. Oh, how do you know when much. a how do you know when a mm. piece is finished? It's just a gut feeling that I get. You know, as where it, I realize that I can't go any further. Mm. You know, I mean, again, you know, as, even though I'll have everything planned out, I always there's always things that I change. 
you know, like, oh, okay, you know what, I need to add this here. Or I'll look at it a little bit, you know, as I'm painting and realize, you know, this area is way too empty. I need to add something to that. And, you know, so I'll, I, you know, so I even, yes, I kind of build it up as I go along. But, you know, once I get to that point where I realize that's it, you know, if I go any further, it's going to be overworked and it's going to look like shit. You know, then that's when I just let it sit for an hour or two, let the paint dry a bit, and then I put my signature on it, and then I just leave it alone. Because once my signature's on it, that's it. It means Never I'm done. Back. Never go back. Nice. What can we expect from you in the future? I mean, you've been really busy this year so far. What What's coming in the next year? Next year, well... I would really like to do some work for some uh, actual certain publications and a couple of companies, some of which have already put me on file because they've nice. liked my work. I just need to kind of keep at it mm-hmm. and keep after them until they finally decide, okay, fine, we'll, uh, you know, we'll send, you, send you a commission. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, and, but as far as like personal, my next thing I really want to do is uh, I want to work on a series of classic monster paintings. Oh, yeah. Stuff that I've, uh, you know, from when I grew up, but not, not what everyone else does. Not like, you know, not like a Gogo's painting, you know, where it's like, okay, yeah, it's the Bride of Frankenstein or it's Frankenstein's monster or it's Dracula. I'm like, I want to do the more obscure ones. The ones that people always wanted to see, but have, haven't been made yet. You know, huh. So those are the ones that I'm going to be concentrating on first. And yeah, at some point, you know, yes, the creature from the Black Lagoon is going to be in there because that's one of my favorites. But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, there's going to be more of the obscure ones, you know, creatures from like the Outer Limits and, you know, old B movies from the 50s that Very only cool. hardcore fans really would, you know, love. <laughs> That would be very, very cool. So are you going to take, do you plan on taking um, a traditional look at these creatures, or are you trying to re-envision them uh, with your own style? It'll be re-envisioned with my own style, you know, as far as like painting techniques and what have you. Um, but again, it'll, it, it's going to depend on the uh, painting itself and what mon- and which creature. Uh, some will, I want to have, uh, there's a few that I want to do where it has a, like this Pulp Fiction you know, cover art look to it, or yeah. uh, or and there's even a few that I want to kind of do with the uh, the uh, men's adventure magazines, you know, with you know where it's got that tension built up, you know, something that people haven't seen yet. And so yeah, I mean, but again, it it depends on the painting. Each painting is you know is unique, and that itself dictates what needs to be done. Yeah. Well, that's very exciting. Um, how can people follow you? Uh, what, what's the best way for people to follow you um, to see the progress in what you're working on? Uh, okay, as far as those would be concerned, that would probably be through my Facebook fan page, you know, and Twitter. That's because um, I'll be. That's where I post. You know, as I, you know, sometimes I'll do a progression shots mm-hmm. where I'm like, "Hey, look, here's the grayscale of the neck of the new painting," and I'll just kind of surprise people. You know, after, you know, everyone's like, oh, I want to see, I want to see. I'm like, all right, here, this is what I'm working on. Sometimes I'll, you know, show each stage, you know, do a progressive shots where people can actually follow it from beginning to end. And and once in a great while, I'll take all those together and put them into a little video format so people can actually see the, uh, the paintings, you know, the stages of the painting morph into each other. And I'll put, I, I post those on YouTube. Very cool. I'm going to definitely be checking that out. So they're just going to go to the, like Facebook and Twitter and just search G. Edwin Taylor? Yeah. Or, again, like through my website. I, my website has links to all of that. So, you know, once you're on that main page, it just, you know, it'll say Facebook fan page. You know, and there's the link. It makes it really easy for people to find me. Yeah. And, and to follow and to actually interact because I always love talking with people. I, I gotta tell you, I, I've been a, a big fan of your work since I found you online as well. Um, you're one of those rare traditional artists that, that actually is painting interesting things and not just uh, you know the regular mundane scenics that <laughs> everyone sees. Look, everyone Mildred, else. there's a cloud. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, or a little cottage in a meadow. Yeah, um, I, I, I get told, like, why Why don't you paint happy things? I'm like, I do paint happy things. I paint things that make me happy. Yeah. And yeah, there's other people that, you know, that are happy when they see it. I'm like, I don't need to paint a flower. You know, uh, how many, uh, you know, how many thousands of others are painting the same flower? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. Um, I think that's going to oh, do it for this problem. week. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was it was, it was really a pleasure talking to you. Um, I always love hearing about people's work from themselves, um, especially real artists. So uh, I, I do really appreciate the time. And everyone out there listening, do yourself a favor. Check out Geodon Taylor's website, taylor9.com, and uh, check out his work. Pick up copies if they're available, and go pick up The King in Yellow. Limited edition. It's not going to be around forever. So while you can, grab it. Uh, treat yourself for the holidays. You know, a little winter solstice present. Um, and until next time we talk, man, uh, hail Satan. Oh, hail Satan, sir. And that's going to do it for another show. I hope you enjoyed it. I did actually have a bizarre, bizarre about sweat. And good sweat versus bad sweat and sexy sweat. But I'm going to wait until next week to bring that to you. Uh, it's been a long day and... I'm ready to have a nightcap and see a little bit of sexy sweat myself, so uh, I'd love to hear from you. Visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let me know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. You can visit the SatanNet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. Listen to the show at RadioFreeSatan.com or download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9CentsPodcast.com. You can also subscribe via iTunes by searching 9 cents and don't forget to leave a rating and or comment. If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, visit churchofsatan.com. And if you'd like to hear other fine satanic voices, music, or personalities, visit radiofreesatan.com, an online streaming radio station. Once again, thank you for joining me, and as always, I'm your host, Adam Campbell, and until next week, Hail Satan!